good morning everyone uh, this is dr amrit kaler and today we are going to talk about the salmon analysis and then we have a series of practical uh, classes following up so um, it, it's a huge topic which needs to be covered uh, but i will be uh, talking uh, the important aspects of different uh, entities that we have at here so let's start with the semen analysis uh, what is what are the indications uh, of uh, th this particular test uh, first of all it is used for the investigation of infertility and then uh, sometimes the patients have undergone uh, post vasectomy so to confirm the absence of sperm and to support the denial of paternity to uh, in all the medical legal cases and sometimes uh, in the cases of um, uh, even rapes then we have uh, for the donors of artificial insemination and for the selection of in vitro fertilization of, and also sometimes to check the reversal of vasectomy in some of the cases so most of the time 90% of the cases it is done in cases of um, infertility when the couple are trying to have a child and they are not able to uh, you know go forward so when the patient the next is when the patient comes to your lab and what should be your instructions and how you should go through it the pre analytic uh, uh, you know errors uh, should not happen so uh, the first thing you need to say is that the patient should have an abstinence for 2 to 5 days or you, sometimes uh, you know if you want to repeat the test it should go even go to 7 days the patient uh, you should give them the proper proce uh, procedure like you should pass urine and you should provide them a wide open container so that when patient uh, gives the sample it should reach the lab within 1 hour of uh, the collection of the sample so within one hour when you see uh, then there are certain certain macroscopic and microscopic criteria which need to be followed and the first one is the uh, appearance the first you check the appearance of the semen it should be white or gray and uh, if it is yellow then you have to look for the contamination with the urine and if it is uh, pink or reddish brown maybe you are suspecting uh, some sort of infection or injury in the either in the bladder or in the urethra so you give a normal liquefaction time which is uh, at least uh, 30 minutes uh, some some semen will get uh, liquefied in 15 minutes some will require uh, 30 minutes but if it is if it takes more than 60 minutes it, and the semen is lumpy so you should think of some prostatic infections or there is some lack of prostatic enzymes in that now the next point is the viscosity if it is normal it is uh, it should be smooth and watery it should not be thick or it should not show uh, lumpy again so whenever you should pick up uh, with the uh, forceps or anything or not forceps you can say uh, you should be able to get the thick and long threads so high viscosity if it is present if it is not able to get separated when you are trying to check the you know viscosity that should that shows that will impede the sperm movements so it means that is not normal then a volume is important to check if it is less than 1 ml it means there is a blockage and if uh, uh, it, and it also may be because of the it, it, it might get can, it cannot neutralize the vaginal acidity and the high semen volume indicates uh, the diluted sperms or some active infection so pH is important if it is less than 7 it is low volume and density sample indicates absence of vas deferens and ejaculatory duct obstruction let's come back to the microscopic examination now you have to charge the neuropart chamber with after diluting it with the semen fluid uh, in a proper ratio and then after charging you have to count all the 10 squares and then multiply it by 50,000 so that will give you an exact count of the sperm uh, of the sperm count so if it is um, less than 15, 15 million that's what is the WHO criteria it is oligospermia the count is less but if it is more than 15 million uh, it shows that sperm count is great so uh, next comes the motility uh, grade A B C D these are the other four grades that we give a grade A is the fast progressive sperms in which the sperms moves side by side and, and it is showing tumbling also and grade B is slow progressive moving forward but not tumbling C is they are moving at the same point but they are uh, alive and the D is they are dead they are immortal 
okay so we just usually grade them from a to d so now uh, you know uh, agglutination has become very important so you have to tell that uh, you how many sperms are agglutinated uh, in in per agglutinate so then you grade them a grade one two and three so uh, this is how uh, we grade it then we have to see whether the attachment the gradation it is from head to head or tail to tail or tip to tip mixed or tangled so this is what is a new uh, advance that we have to report then this is the WHO criteria which tells you about the salmon volume 1.5 sperm concentration total sperm number then progressive motility 32 total motility should be 40 and vitality is important nowadays I'll talk about it 58% and morphology you know normal morphology should be at least uh, should be more than 4% pH more than 7.2 leukocyte count should not be seen you should not be seeing pus cells in it if it is present it means there's infection and it has to be treated then uh, some people do this uh, uh, immuno B test which is used for agglutinations so you can go to read about it but it's not important for your exams now uh, then we stain them uh, with uh, some of uh, the vital stains, the provital stains, and then we look for the defects, the head defects, and the mid, uh, neck piece defects, or the tail defects, because this is how then uh, uh, the patient need to be treated. So uh, you know you can see there are double heads, or some are having neck pieces missing, or some tail defects are there. They are not able to swim, or there are double tails. So these are the abnormalities which you have to know because you have you have to report it in a slide then vitality is the uh, how are they motile or are they able to stumble or swim across so the, on the left side you can see they are dead sperms and if when you stain them they if they take up the color it means they are dead if they do not take up it means they are alive so this is also a vitality assessment which is important how many sperms are actually vital they are able to fertilize the ovum now terminologies are used the oligospermia I have told asthenospermia in which the motility is less teratozoospermia in which less than 4% spermatozoa are um, you know actually in the functioning condition then all these terminologies are not very important for you but uh, aspermia and pyospermia hematospermia necrozoospermia you can just keep them in mind so uh, overall assessment I mean you should know how to report a semen and you should know different uh, parameters which are assessed to report the semen analysis so this was all about it now the next is the eosinophil count in the practical section uh, you know what are eosinophils they are a part of WBCs and uh, you can um, uh, see uh, 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 they are wide lobed and they have uh, bluish brick red granules and uh, how much is the uh, actual eosinophil count in the blood it should be less than six percent so two to six percent is the total uh, eosinophil count so if the above is the calculator in which if you see the WBC count is 20,000 so 20,000 you have to just and if the patient shows two percent eosinophil count so two percent of 20,000 will give you the absolute eosinophil count okay so it's not, it's not a very difficult just a percentage which uh, sometimes the clinicians want it because the WHO parameters are in absolute values all right the next one is the reticulocyte count the, the reticulocytes are nothing but they are the immature RBCs which come in the circulation and uh, they are the products of the nucleated RBCs and the uh, the stain which is being used in the slide is a supravital stain, a toilet in blue, and the dark blue, uh, uh, the crystals or you can say the materials in the cytoplasm is nothing but an RNA. It is uh, because it is still immature, the RNA has not been taken out before they actually get converted into RBCs. And they stay in the circulation for one to two days. So the most important is uh, the presence of them indicates how much is marrow, you know, producing the RBC. So this is very com important uh, indicator in hemolytic anemias, and also that is why reticulocyte is, uh, you know, being asked by the clinicians just to see if the marrow is uh, functioning or not. So how do you uh, calculate them? The percentage is very easy. You count the thousand RBCs. And then count the number of reticulocytes, then number of reticulocytes divided by the thousand RBCs into 100. 
it's it's very st- simple and straightforward so if you want to uh, calculate the absolute then uh, whatever percentage you have calculated into rbc count if it is you know rbc count is in uh, what 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 digit it's in millions okay divided by 100 all right then we have the corrected reticulocyte count uh, in patients uh, sometimes we have a low hematocrit like the iron deficiency anemia or uh, you know the patient has uh, lost the blood immediately so or in even in hemolytic anemia sometimes the patient is having a very low hematocrit and the percentage of reticulocytes will be falsely elevated because the rbc count is less in those cases so a correction factor has introduced in this particular scenario of uh, hemolytic anemias in which the rbc count is less and the reticulocyte count is high so we calculate the corrected reticulocyte count how do we do that so th- we take out the percentage and then multiply it with, with the patient's hematocrit divided by 45 which is a normal hematocrit so this is how we calculate the corrected reticulocyte count which is very important to know now the last thing about reticulocytes is how much is the normal percentage in the adults it is 0.2 to 2 percent in France is 2 to 6 percent and the children up to five years is 0.2 to 5 percent so you just have to remember it at an infant percentage and so these are the conditions in which reticulocytes can be increased and decreased please go through it and uh, you know learn it properly the next one is the lupus erythromatous cell it is nothing but uh, this LE cell is seen in uh, uh, most of the conditions of uh, uh, SLE uh, autoimmune disorders basically so what happens is antigen a- antibody reaction is going on inside the body and the you know antigen is the body's own cell which is considered as foreign and uh, these antibodies they go and act against the self antigens and they produce the destruction and the destruction can happen either in the thyroid or it can happen in any part of the body so uh, and it may involve uh, uniformly in all parts of the body and that condition is known as SLE systemic lupus erythromatosis so what happens is this antigen antibody products which are being formed they are ingested by macrophages and uh, the nucleus of these uh, macrophages is pushed to the periphery and uh, the cytoplasm is filled with this the nuclear material so these are known as LE cells and these were the diagnostic tests which were seen in SLE a long time back before uh, the uh, other test serum t- serology came out so it is not it is around 70 percent spe- sensitive and um, and specific specificity is also quite low so these are not normally used in the diagnostic procedures r- uh, right now but you should know about what are LD cells so this is a, a dot cell uh, another differential diagnosis of LE cell it is a basically a histiocyte against uh, uh, you know engulfed uh, or a monocyte basically which has engulfed the nuclear material so this these cells are of no diagnostic value so it should not be mistaken for LE cell that's why I have uh, shown you in the picture as well okay now the last one is the type of needles uh, in the bone marrow aspiration uh, you have to know the indications of bone marrow aspirations you have to know uh, what are the indications and the contraindications what are the complications of bone marrow aspiration i think you have done it so today's class is only about the type of needles so i'll be talking only about that but you have to know in detail about the different uh, procedures which are being used different sites which are being used in bone marrow aspiration and um, also in adults what are the sites and then children what are the different sites and uh, what are the complications what are the contraindications all this thing please uh, please learn by heart now this is uh, the clima needle and jamshiti needle which are being used in bone marrow aspiration the most commonly available is clima needle and uh, this can be reused again again and again and uh, jamshiti is a disposable which is available at a very nominal rate now is I think around three to four hundred and uh, the patient it is disposable so the infection cannot be carried there's no other problem of uh, you know infecting the other patients so what happens is uh, this has a typical this needle uh, you can see in the right side it has a trocar tip because it has to go inside the bone so this trocar tip 
we just push it inside and then we have a sample extractor in which we put up the needle and then we aspirate the material so these are the two different types of needles common sites uh, please remember alia crest turnum and tibial crest uh, so this is how it is done and these are the equipments you know gloves and needles and uh, let look in patient might need uh, simple anesthesia to go at that site and uh, you know so that the pain is lesser when you uh, impregnate the bone so uh, uh, please are uh, they do remember the needles they are they will be kept in the exam and please uh, know the indications and the contraindications of the bone marrow needles so wish you all the best and please read uh, all your classes and i have told you basically how to calculate all the values and uh, do understand how to report the seven analysis okay this is dr ambedkar signing off all right and see you